Welcome to the Market Huddle with Patrick the Content Machine Serezna and Kevin the Macro Tourist Muir. So grab a drink, get comfortable, and get ready for a deep dive into the markets. Take it away, guys. It's December 28th, 2018, episode number eight. I'm Patrick Ceresna. And I'm Kevin Muir. Thanks for taking time out to join us. The Market Huddle is a weekly show where Patrick and myself get together over a couple of beers to talk about the week's action in the market, making sure to keep each other's feet to the fire and have a little fun in the process. Now, this show is broadcast as both a podcast and on YouTube. So if you're enjoying this as a podcast and feel like you're missing out on the charts and videos we're referencing, you can register at markethuddle.com website and get the weekly email that includes the chart pack and video links or just flip over to YouTube. Now, in this week's episode, we're going to touch on the most important things that happened this week. We're going to look at the anatomy of the dead cap balance and the repricing of the Fed put. In our This Week in Trading History segment, we look back to the Hunt brothers cornering the silver market. And for this week's WTF Clip of the Week, a throwback to the late 80s when Harry Dent met Sally. And in our Tales from the Trading Desk, we're going to take a closer look at leveraged ETFs and we're going to end with the three most important things to watch whoa, next whoa, week. Whoa, 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 whoa three what happened to five i thought we were doing five patrick all right we're, we're gonna get to that at the uh, end there <laughs> all okay, right let's, let's jump, jump into, into it okay so first of all let's talk about our sponsor yeah who, um, who's uh, this week uh brought to us by so i i don't know we're ta- we're taping this friday afternoon and in the last hour the s p's rallied 40 handles and then sold off 50 handles in the space of out of it in like what a couple 60 hours. minutes yeah. yeah so uh I thought that when we were looking at the sponsors that this one was particularly apt. It's Bone Shaker Unfiltered Indian Pale Ale. So let's wow. open it up. Uh, you know what's crazy? I'm just looking. This yeah. is a 7% <laughs> beer. 7%? <laughs> okay. Like this is, this is like a strong beer. Well, I think that's a good call. That's 7% <laughs> because we need it. Oh my God, this, this tastes awful. <laughs> Whoa, whoa, whoa. You, you can't be doing that. You can't be telling our sponsors that their beer is awful, Patrick. Okay, all right. So let me rephrase that. What an interesting beer, Kevin. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so oh, this is going to be a wow. Okay. Ah. No, we got to get through it. Okay, I have to do my legal stuff. So here yeah. we go. You, you enjoy your beer, Patrick, <laughs> by our wonderful sponsor. Oh, yeah. Um, clients and employees of East West Investment Management may hold p- positions and securities mentioned in this podcast. Nothing in this podcast should be viewed as investment advice. Listeners should consult an investment professional before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned in the show. For more information, please visit eastwestfunds.com. You know, does it does it taste a little bit nutty to you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, all the, when you said that, all I can think about is Austin Powers. That's, a, that's where I was going. <laughs> Okay, so Patrick, <laughs> let's get on to the markets. What do you think was the biggest thing that you were like most important well, thing you were watching this week? Well, listen, it, what it, we we got a short term market bottom. I don't think there's any disputing that. The question is, what will, will it become bigger? So, really, what I wanted to spend um, uh, a little bit of time talking about is the anatomy of a dead cat bounce. Now, for our listeners that are not familiar with the term dead cat bounce, it's sort of, it's the idea that when something goes crashing to the floor, when it hits, it bounces off of there. Well, it's it's when something crashes a long way, like when a cat falls out of a building and then bounces a little at the end. But if you think about how much a cat is going to bounce off the cement, it's going to be pretty minimal. It's more so like a splat, is, right? Yeah. So that is the anatomy of a dead cat bounce. It's okay, basically so that, a very uh, small bounce from a big You would think line. we would have thought this through when trying to explain this. But anyway, it's the idea that after a market crash, there's going to be a reaction. Uh, and so now I think that bounces are a little bit more than just dead cat. But I wanted to first just you uh, point out a headline. So those of our uh, podcast listeners, the headline is from CNBC, and it says the Dow rallies 1,000 points, logging its biggest single day point or single point gain ever. And so we had this historical day. Now, what I find particularly interesting about a headline like that is is that it doesn't. 
to me, the markets, uh, when the volatility of a market increases, Kev, then the moves are relative. So if you're going to be ha able to have a thousand point down day, you can just as easily have a thousand point up day. It, yeah. It's all in context of the market conditions. And so right. and, I, and I have a problem with the thousand points because as the market rallies, you're going to get from a higher base, you're going to get moves whenever you're talking about points. They're always the record single day. Yeah, you know, this was not the single biggest percentage gain. It yeah, was a, it, but it wasn't that, that big a deal. And I remember that, you know, there's been days when the S&P moved eight, nine percent on big, huge bear market rally days. So this yeah. was what, five? Yeah, well, the, I want, we'll get to percentages in a moment. I want to I want to talk about that. Point being, is that this is like the they they try to make this like this big, great, amazing thing that happened w when uh, the market r uh, rallied a thousand points. But you know, I I personally think that it, it was a pretty pathetic rally, uh, it, it, at least on par to what we normally see in the markets on reaction. I want to so I wanted to just highlight the analog of kind of comparing. The current drop in the market to the last bear market we had, which was back in 2008. That's right. So and for the for the listeners that are just listening to this, we've basically taken the chart and we've taken the S and P 500 and we've turned it into percent changes and we've put the 2008 bear market over the current decline. Right. And if you look, that they're tr they're actually following each other fairly closely. But they were both 20% declines, and the current decline happened faster than it did in 2008 off of the peak. W when we're talking about this being a bear market, and I do believe it's a bear market. Do you believe this is a bear market? Yeah, I do believe that we've been. Yeah, so I, I believe it's a bear market as well. And so, uh, so to me, I want to kind of put in context that uh, it, what happened after the in, uh, the last bear market decline that we had, like in in the start of two thousand, so late two thousand seven and the start of two thousand eight, and to me, notice here that in the four months after this first decline, the market was actually higher by let's say May of two thousand and eight than it was in January of two thousand eight. That's right. So it, it you would think that it was just straight down, but it's not. And you it's, get a lot of squiggles in there. Like, and this is this is where one of my narratives I'm sharing with big picture trading members is that look, while I'm I do believe it's a bear market, odds are that if you're short selling right now, you're sort of late to the party. Uh, I think I, uh, this is not when you begin new short selling operations in my mind. And so you're you're writing you're thinking of writing blue tickets first is what you're saying. You know, I, I yes, there's opportunities to uh, to kind of play some uh, fade some of the very oversold conditions and rally and write some blue tickets. But uh, I, I'm not overly excited of going long, but I'm certainly not adding short. I like this you. is this is not the time to be shorting new shorts yeah. in my mind. I think maybe and I actually I actually think that by February we're at a higher price than where we are today. Oh, That's so I, I, I'm on the other side of the fence there. So, you know, good thing because we've been agreeing a little too much lately. So this is good. I think. So you think we're going lower from here? Well, no, I think we're going to rally into the end of the year and we might have a, a good end week. of the year. The, it is the end of the year. There's one more trading day in the end of the I year. I guess so. But so what are you I, saying that Monday we're, we're selling? No, I think uh, you might. I was uh, before you so rudely interrupted me, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was about to say and we might rally in the first week of the year. But I noticed a lot of people thinking that uh, I saw Char Charlie McGilliot, uh say something about the fact that he thinks that a lot of people are waiting to put on risk in the new year. I think that the real long term money hasn't started selling yet. So mm -hmm. I think come the new okay. year, when all the investment management or committees go into, you know, have their meetings, they're going to come out and they're going to turn out with some pink tickets. I also think, though, that anybody who turns around and uh, gets their statements next year in terms of their performance are going to be calling them brokers up and say, get me out. Like, I think yeah. there is. There's well, aren't a, you making my point, though? That's like well, they haven't but, really started selling. But why, why, didn't, why didn't it happen in uh, February and March of last? Uh, well, of I don't, last I don't think it was as bad. 
What I do you mean? Think... It was a twenty percent drop. No, the same but way. it was. But it was. It wasn't in all asset classes. Oh it was my much God. more. Okay, yeah, there, it was, it was... So anyone who was in a commodity basket didn't. No, have a... but there was other. It, this has been more. The credit's gotten hit harder. There's been more like the uh, the sixty forty portfolio that a typical investor has is down more today than okay. they were in two, in the early uh, of two thousand eighteen. Anyway, listen. We both agree that the stock market's in a bear market and now it's going lower. We can. We'll call the play by play. That, listen, all of you listening, tune in on a week in, week, week out basis as me and Kevin are going to call the play by play on this. But okay. I, I'm still thinking that this oversold condition has room. So I wanted to just share quickly because I want we don't, I want to move on from this. But I want to just point out what happens uh, dur uh, during these market bounces. So this is the most recent sell off on the chart that I'm showing. And so since the G20 pop and drop the prairie dog that me and you were, were joking about, we had a, a, about an 18% decline in the market that happened in, in about a month. Right. Yeah. And uh, so it's an 18% decline. And so far the bounce in three days off of the low has been about a 9% rally about half, we we've bounced half of the decline. Right. Right so now, that, that, now that so you're thinking that there, we've got more to bounce. Um, yes, but I want to kind of go on a journey as to how these things look in past situations. So like notice here uh, now, mind you, back in February when we had the vol event, we were in the midst of a bull market. Right. And the uh, and but the, when the vol event occurred, we had a market that dropped uh, back in February. The market dropped in about a week and a half, like two weeks, it dropped about 12% within one day, within 20, I'd say 48 hours, it bounced 8% in, uh, so it went dropped 12 and then bounced 8%. But notice that within five days, it double bottomed, went all the way back to its previous lows. But then about over the next two months into the middle of March, the S uh, the S&P 500 rallied about 11% off of the lows. But that that was still a bull market, though, and I think that's that was the still difference. a bull market. I I I, I agree. But I, but what I wanted to do is we're talking about the anatomy of of um, of dead cap bounces after sell offs, right? So I wanted to touch on the sell off after um, August 2015. In a matter of four days, the S and P wiped out about 13 percent, right? That was the summer uh, kind of so the no, August, yeah, August. Yeah, that was the summer plunge that yeah, occurred out of nowhere for no real reason. It was just kind uh, of. I think it was China driven when when the China stock uh, market broke. But there was no I mean, real the, the reason. China A fifty broke badly then, and so I okay. think it was uh, there was a little shock factor and a low liquidity period, right? Yeah. But anyway, it happened. But notice that after that that plunge, within four days, the market rallied nine percent, more than yeah. half. Right. But it still retested the low about a month later, right? Right. And that was the same with the previous chart that you actually yeah. showed as well. No, no, and and there's no denying that the ne there could theoretically be a sell off that retests the low. I just am not convinced that the next major leg down is coming here in February. But I wanted to go and two more two more dead cap bounces to look at. Uh, we had the 2011 a uh, little nine day market plunge that occurred. Uh, and back then in August, 2011, that was the, by the way, the, the steepest decline we had out of all the ones we're measuring. This was a 20% plunge in nine days, right? Right. And five days later, the market was up about 12%, about 129 points back then. The point being is, is that dead cap bounces happen and they usually go about half the distance of the drop. Uh, okay. all rule of thumb. There's been ones that went more, but there's this reaction. But many of these charts go back to revisit those lows. So, uh, look. Uh, with that being said, I'd have to say that there's a re there. It's not out of line for us to in January go and retest the lows. It's not impossible. Uh, I won't rule it out. But I still think that the bigger bear market plunge, the one where the S and P can go down to two thousand or some crazy number like that. Uh, or lower, I think that that happens after a multi-month pause. Uh, okay. I think I think it's like a second or third quarter story. I think when when the economic data really starts to get rotten, that's the scenario where I could see something like that playing out. Does a what do you think of that? 
Um, I'm not sure, and we're going to talk about the Fed put, okay. and, 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 and yeah, I'm so, not sure okay, I We're going to move on because to the Fed put. One last one I want to show yeah. you. After the, uh, the, uh, the 2010 flash crash, we wiped out 13% in a couple of days. That was when the guy that did it from his basement, the, right? Yeah, the fat finger. Uh, no, no, the guy from the basement. That was the one that they're, supposedly they blamed it on, a, on a, a spoofer trader in his basement in London. I'm pretty sure that was it, man. That was the one. Uh, anyway, that, guy, that poor guy's well, going to jail is, for that. Yeah. Anyway, the guy. The guy. Anyway, but it dropped thirteen percent in a couple days, but it was essentially back. Uh, it rallied eleven percent in the subsequent uh, uh, trading week. The, yeah. um, so the the point being is that these reactions, the magnitude of the drop, the reaction on the other side, often has a direct proportion to the prior drop. So for us to have rallied off of the current low by only, I'm going to go back and measure. So, so currently, while you're figuring that out, I, I would, would like to point out one thing. Every single one of those things, of those instances that you showed us, the Not rally one of was, in was, was rally was around kind of anywhere from eight to 11%. And then it sagged again. And then so, it sagged again. Yeah, and so and here we had it. But, but the one thing I was going to point out is, is that we, okay, we have a 9% bounce, but the magnitude of the drop of 17%, I would have said on a comparative basis, we should have been up 12, 13%. And maybe we will. Maybe, maybe by middle, end of next week, we might be at 2,600 on the S&P. But from all of these, a retest of the low is not something that any of our listeners should be surprised by. That's right. All right. So that's that's what I was uh, going to share. So, Kev, what was the most important thing that you wanted to talk about this week? Well, for me, I think that there's something really big and fundamental going on. And it, it, this is kind of at the heart of what's driving the markets. And the real question is whether the Fed put – has been repriced with Powell. And when, when I say the Fed put, this is the um, the tendency of the Federal Reserve to come in and uh, uh, cut rates when something goes wrong in either the markets or the economy. And what I want to do is this first chart is is uh, something that a lot of getting a lot of talk. And what it is, is it's the second euro dollar future contract versus the six euro dollar futures contract. And euro dollar is, is basically three month money for uh, U.S. dollars overseas. And so think about it as kind of short term interest rates. And so what it is, more is importantly, the LIBOR rates that euro dollar is priced on is money outside of the U.S. banking system. That's right. right. So, and so so this is basically the LIBOR yield curve. Yeah. And if you look, um, you'll see that over history, we've had a few instances where they it is inverted meaning that the far month is is trading at a yield that is lower than the near month. And that typically happens when the market is anticipating problems, right? Like, and in, in this yeah. is what we're seeing currently. And recently we did invert and we're actually minus 10 basis points, nine and a half basis points. And so the real question is, what's going to happen um, uh, in terms of will the Fed react as both either the economy or the financial markets slow. Right. And this is what I think is happening. And I want to go through kind of the different periods in time. And so the first one you'll see that I, that I circled is the, by, 19- by, the by the way, um, do you, do you track the Ted spread? Like where or has the Ted spread been widening? Well, here, I'll just pull it up on the old Bloomberg. Let's just have a look. It, it, so it, so those, those of our listeners that don't know what the TED spread is, it's the spread between uh, LIBOR rates and three-month treasury. So it's, it's basically money in the Fed system and money outside of the Fed system. It's looking at international U.S. dollars versus domestic U.S. dollars. And usually when there's a crisis, the, then uh, international U.S. dollars have to pay a premium. Is that r- the best way of describing it? Yeah, so it has, and that is, well, it's basically bank credit risk versus government risk. Right. So it's, it's, it's a measure of risk in the system. And yes, it, it has spiked over the last little bit. So it, it's gone from zero to 46. Now, 
strange things happen a month at year end, so I'm not sure I would go and read too. Let's much. look at that, it next week. Let's yeah, let, okay. w- let's let's visit. Okay. Anyway, so what's the what's the so let's go through at? these. These are all the different easing cycles that based upon the periods of which the euro dollar two versus six uh, yield spread inverted. And I'm going to go through them all. The first one was the 1987 crash. Okay. So that's the famous black Monday. The fed came in and they lowered rates and you can see what happened there. They took it from seven down to six and a quarter. Uh, Basically the economy took off after that. And then they were back to raising within a year. We go to the next one, which was the 1989 recession. You'll see that actually was a recession and they went and they stopped. They, they had taken rates from six and a half all the way up to nine and three quarters. They started easing and they kept easing the whole time. Okay. Then we go and then there was the 1985 or sorry, the 1995 uh, inversion. And this was an economic slowdown. It wasn't actually a recession. But if you go look, the uh, unemployment uh, claims ticked up and there was there was threats of the economy slowing and the Fed was quick again to lower rates and they took it from six down to five and a half. Now, the interesting thing about this was that in doing that, they set up by being easy, they set up the problems that were to occur in 1998. And that's the next chart. And you'll see that the inversion in 1998 was the direct result of the long-term capital crisis and 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 long-term management capital crisis. We got a feature that in uh, this week in history when the, when the date comes up. That's for that's sure. A great story. And this was basically a market event that the that the the Federal Reserve stepped in and said, "No, we have to go. We have to provide liquidity to the market because there's problems." And they flooded the system. They lowered rates, and they and that was basically the birth of the fed put that was when it really became clear that they were tuning for financial markets as opposed to the real economy because let's face it the long-term capital crisis wasn't affecting the average show like it wasn't like the 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 worker on main street was worried about long-term capital it was purely a financially financially driven crisis that Greenspan reacted to by lowering rates. Now, the interesting thing about that is that that, again, that liquidity spurned basically the dot-com bubble, which then exploded into the 2000s. And again, you know, they had to go and raise rates till they finally raised rates too much and it caused the whole thing to roll over. And then next thing they know, they're spending all their time cutting. The next one is the great financial crisis crash or credit crisis Crisis. and that that was actually in 2007 you'll see that between 2004 and 2006 they were walking up interest rates and then they left them there and and the interesting thing about this was for the longest time Bernanke was actually uh slow to raise to lower rates he sat there and said no you know remember his famous quote that everything's fine in the housing market there's no problems that's like uh, there's there's isolated examples but there's no problems and so it took him too long to lower rates right now why i point all these things out is the market has become convinced that the fed put is real that if they go and they push down financial conditions enough if they take the stock market down if they take um you know, credit spreads and they widen them, that the Fed will respond by lowering rates. And in essence, that's what's happened during this crisis is that the the market kept taking the market down lower and lower and lower, stock market lower and lower and lower. And the Fed did not respond, you know, dovishly enough. And every time they refused to, to respond dovishly, they took the market down even worse. And every right. time Trump complained about them not responding dovishly enough, they realized that they, that, that caused the Fed to go be less able. They basically hamstrung the, 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 the Fed in terms of being able to, to lower rates and made them less likely to lower rates. So every one of Trump's tr- tweets actually caused the market to sell off more. Now, A lot of smart guys are convinced that the Fed is going to go and lower rates in 2019. I saw David Rosenberg. He's talking about the fact that 
uh, the market. Yeah, but the euro dollar markets here are even predicting that, are they not? For sure, you're right. The market is pricing in a lot of, uh, you know, federal. There, there, no one, everyone's calling uh, the Powell bluff that that essentially he's saying that we're still going to keep raising, and yeah. everyone's saying no, you're not going to be raising. You're going to be cutting by the end of the year. That's right. And and the, my question to you is, what if Powell's not bluffing? What if he is serious that he does he wants to take away the Fed put? And right now, I think I bet you then Trump's going to have him in a headlock and give him the Powell driver. That could very well be, <laughs> but I think that the market is underpricing the possibility that he will be more tone deaf than they are expecting. Okay, let me let me uh, not push back, but let me give you a different alternative. What if the Fed is realizing that they wanted more ammunition uh, before the next downturn, and they're realizing that they couldn't get rates higher to, so that they have a higher starting point for their cutting. What if the scenario is that they're realizing they've only got so many bullets that they're going to wait till things get really bad before they start wasting bullets early? Well, all you're doing is agreeing with me. I, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with you. I actually just want to like give you a different perspective, which is that basically they don't have that much ammunition this time around. So what, what if they want to first wait till the market mean reverts down to a level where fundamentally it's at a place where they can use the bullets and actually create a turn where things are actually at yeah. the right levels? It, well, I don't know whether they're thinking about it that way. I think they're realizing that they're too beholden to the stock market, to too, too beholden to, to Wall Street, and they want to be more worried about Main Street. Now, okay, in but terms the of Wall Reserve Street, whoa, 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 stop one second. But one, stop one second. Can you pull up a chart of the S&P 500 for me? And can yeah. you go and put it from 2008 to the present day? Can yeah. we look at like a monthly? Sure. And and in 2008, we 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 bottomed at what 666 or something. It was basically the devil's number, right? Like it was around there. Yeah. So yeah. now this is the future. So yeah, actually, it doesn't no, matter. Yeah. So oh, step back and think about this. That's 666. The, like right there. we have gone from oh. from most everybody on Wall Street talking about the problems of easy money and complaining about all of Yellen, Bernanke, and uh, Greenspan's policies to the point where the most hawkish guys, both Stanley Druckenmiller and Warsh, are, are openly calling for them to pass on their, on their rate hikes right. because of a decline of how much? Like, let's well, look at this. Well, yeah, it's, the, the, it's, well like, we've been 20% from, from peak 20%, to trough. But, but how much are we up? Over the last, you know, oh. eight years. Oh, that's that's huge. Hold on. Yeah. So, so the, we, uh, yeah, we. I mean, listen. But listen, measuring from the lowest level is pretty. Uh, but just is data but, mining. But, but anyway, we've but, had a three hundred and fifty percent rally. Off and we have given up twenty percent. No, it's more. It's not. It's okay, twenty percent on the currently. So it's not really twenty percent because that's the, the math doesn't work. But yeah, but the math. The point work. is that it is very minor in the grand scheme of things and what i worry about is that everyone is convincing themselves just like they convinced themselves that powell was going to pass this time and when he didn't pass they were all shocked i think everyone is convincing themselves that oh you know what he made a mistake last time he really doesn't mean that he's really more like yellen and bernanke whereas i'm like you know what He's a bright guy, and I'm I'm thinking he fully expected and 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 knew that this was a possibility, and I'm not making judgment about what is correct and what is wrong, what is right. I'm only saying that You're the market observer. is underestimating the possibility that he will stay hawkish for longer, and that the 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 Fed put has been dramatically restruck much much lower. You know, you know, there's a in, in that book written by um, uh, Malden and Tepper, they they wrote that book, a Red Alert. And so I, I believe in, it was in that book where they quoted that uh, back, they did a survey back in the 90s 
of 50 economists and asked the question is what's the probability of a recession that year? And I think only the, I, the number was like 3%. I mean, I, I'm going from, I might be wrong about the numbers. I'm just uh, try, going with the story of what I remember. And it was like 3%, yet any uh, recessions happen about 15% of the time. So they were literally underestimating. And afterwards, they found out that the survey was taken already three months into a recession, and these economists didn't even know. Oh, and, and yeah. and the point but the point what I'm getting at with this is is that if Powell is going to remain hawkish I feel that there is a very good chance that there's going to be a recession and when there is most people are not going to see it every cuz everyone that I've talked to that is defending the fundamentals is saying the economy is strong and the stock market's got it wrong and, and the economy just is, is holding up and all of this thing. But what happens when six months from now, everyone realizes a recession? Well, I, I'm not disagreeing with you there. I'm not arguing about what the outcome would like saying that he's got the correct policy. I'm telling you, I think this is what he believes. All right. I be, I, and I'm saying that I think that this is a greater chance. That's a very so big, it, that's a very it, bearish call you're making, by the yeah, way. Yeah. Well, and and that's the, that's how I that's how I feel. That's how I see it. I I think that he is yeah. not going to go and kowtow to uh, Wall Street. All right. Let's move on. Okay. Before we get on to this week in trading history, I just want to kind of fix our problem with our sponsor there. That since you said all those terrible things. Um, I love my bone shaker in unfiltered India PLL. What do you think, uh, Patrick? <laughs> uh, well, it's kicked in. That's for sure. <laughs> I was 7%. I I, I, it actually tastes a little like turpentine. I must say like it, like you could actually taste. <laughs> I didn't think that 7% would make a difference, but you can tell taste the difference in the alcohol. <laughs> okay. So this week in trading history, um, we dug into the archives and we found something that's near and dear to Patrick's heart. So take it away, bud. All right, so I wanted to talk about uh, the Hunt brothers and uh, them quartering the silver market back in 1979, 1980. And so the Hunt, oh, so what I, we're sort of a week late on this, but last week uh, was just a story we had to have. So it was back, uh, the story was back on December 21st of uh, actually 1989 where um, the story was that the two Hunt brothers were fined and subsequently banned from trading. Uh, so it, it was after the lawsuit and them being charged for, uh, for cornering the silver market. But really the event uh, occurred in, uh, about a decade earlier in 1979 and uh, 1980. So what we can do is we can look at the chart here of silver and what it did back in 1979 and 1980. So, and so just we, for people that are, you know, listening to this, in 1979, it was trading at six bucks. By September of 70, like that was at the beginning of 79. By September, it had risen to 10, at which point it took off. It, it was, ran like it stole something. By kind of uh, middle of the fall, it was trading at 16, 18 bucks, and then it really got exciting. It went from right. I mean, we were talking limit up silver yeah. on the way up. Now, you, what, what, Kev, when was the last time you saw anything in the futures market go limit up? I know it's been forever. People probably don't it's even know forever. what that means. Like, yeah, like most people, people have no idea what yeah. limit up means. So just to explain it, it used to be that when something it used moved, to be, it still is. It still well, is. We just haven't seen it. Yeah. Okay. Maybe you're right. Uh, when something moved by a certain percentage, it would, they would actually stop trading at that point because they wanted everyone to take a break and think about what, you know, how, whether they wanted to buy they it. Would trade, they would stop it for the day. There's a, yeah, there's so a it, limit. Well, for they the would day, basically not allow limit. it to trade above this price. So, right. you know, we, we say that there's nothing that trades limit anymore. That's not quite true. Lumber seems to still trade limit every single day. Like, go look at lumber. It, it like, literally, for some reason, they have this limit, and it like, gets locked limit all the time. But nobody trades lumber. So the last time, some, like, something big like this 
traded limit was was in the seventies in the late seventies early eighties when we had. Oh, there this was inflation. there was the treasury limits that were happening uh, last decade. Anyway, but it, well, it was, the point. Let's let's not get off the topic yeah. here. So so the, the point it is, would trade it, so it would take multiple days. Like imagine there was a point of something new some new fundamental information that, that would take some take silver from 16 bucks to 35 bucks but the trouble is that the limit would be three bucks a day so it would basically go up to the limit and then just stop trading it would be bid there there would, everyone would line up to bid it and then it would go up the next day another three bucks and it would go up and it would take a week before it actually traded yeah. again and this is what happened and this was super scary imagine being short and you can't trade it and it's just kind of like trading lock limit up every day. It's, it's oh, crazy. It was crazy. It's, it's so, nuts. so Kev, I I got a little video clip which I want to show everyone uh, to, and then we could talk about it here after we watch it. So let's let everyone watch it. This this is a off of YouTube, so we'll just stream it right off of there and have a look. silver market is where the big players like Bunker Hunt stake their millions. With his own fortune now linked to Saudi billions, Hunt was the biggest player of all. When Hunt started buying silver in earnest in January 1979, the price was a little over six dollars an ounce. Hunt watchers reckon that he owned about 50 million ounces. Hunt bought steadily throughout the whole of the year. By January 1980, when the price peaked at $52, Bunker Hunt had stashed away, say the market men, about 150 million ounces, between a third and two-thirds of one year's supply. But it couldn't last. When silver speculators saw the gold price tumble, they started to take their profits in silver. Then President Carter launched a credit squeeze, and the banks who had been lending money to help the speculators buy silver called in the loans. Then, on March the 27th, Black Thursday they're calling it, the market nosedived. The price dropped to just over $10 an ounce, and the Hunt Syndicate lost well over $2 billion that day in paper profits. What had happened was that Beish, Hunt's principal broker, had asked their client for more cash to cover the debts he had built up during his buying spree. Beish was in danger because of the market practice of buying silver on credit, on margin as it's called. If the price falls, the broker demands more money or margin to cover himself. What a great clip uh, that was. Like, that Bunker Hunt and, um, and Hubert Hunt, they, the two brothers, they literally got Saudi money involved and they started buying up silver and they were, I mean, they had just billions of dollars of silver locked up and they were riding the leverage of the silver market to the max. But when silver reversed, uh, when silver reversed and oh shit, what was the name of that firm? Prudential Prudential Beige. Beish, there you go. So the, the Beish Securities basically was stuck. They were giving the Hunt brothers a margin call and they weren't coming up with the money. And they, and they knew that if they went and started selling their stuff into the market, that they would destroy the silver market. And so they went to the CFTC uh, and they basically were asking. So the CFTC is the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. And they basically went there and said, listen, make the Hunt brothers either pay their margin or you guys got to shut down the exchange. And the the uh, CFTC just gave the, the company the big birdie. And they said, <laughs> no, we're not we're not, we're not doing this. And this it, it literally went and collapsed the silver markets afterwards. And so silver went from six dollars to to forty two dollars and then from forty two dollars back to like 
ten dollars all know, within a couple months. We're complaining about fifty handles in the S and P, but like look at the volatility there. That's oh, that ins- was crazy. Insane. But it does remind me of the silver story. I want to talk about it in the tales from the trading desk. But then I want to talk about two thousand eleven because this story deserves us to elaborate on it anyway. And so let's get back to it. Interesting story. The Hunt brothers they got nailed for trying to corner the market. I guess the, you know what when you're a billionaire. Yeah, I mean, you you need to corner something. That's the only way to make it interesting, isn't it? <laughs> spice it up a little. Well, spice I think, it up I a think little, the like... trouble is that, that, let's face it, they weren't too smart because it didn't work for them, right? Like let's It didn't say, work. And, I, like, I mean, at, at one point, they were worth $5 billion, which yeah. to, in today's dollars is equivalent to, like, $50 billion. They, when they were being sued in the civil thing, they, the, co- the company – ended up filing for bankruptcy. I don't think they went bankrupt, but it, they basically destroyed their entire wealth in this entire, in a yeah, decade. Yeah, You have to give them credit, though, for going just balls to the wall. Like, there's, the wall. like there's just no, like, like they were like, I'm in, I'm going all out. We're going to corner this thing. Silver used to be worth six bucks. I think at 42, <laughs> it's a great buy. <laughs> all right, let's move on. Okay, let's move on to the WTF clip of the week. And, uh, I have to just be honest with you. This one, Patrick's just been itching to to get me to make a video. <laughs> and uh, why didn't you tell which video it was that you wanted done, Patrick? Okay, well, uh, you know what? I'm going to answer that after we watch the video. Well, okay. So before we watch the video, though, let me just put it this way. The When Harry Met Sally clip that I chose was definitely more classy <laughs> than Patrick's choice. <laughs> all okay. right. Let's watch it. Bubbles always defy gravity, always keep going higher than anybody expects them to. And, and, and each bubble tends to be stronger than the last one. So, so that's what we're looking at. And now the other thing about bubbles is that, hey, this could have been a top two in, in late September, early October, but it didn't look like a top like the January top did. Bubbles tend to go out, not with a whimper, but with a bang, with an orgasm. Hey, I don't feel great about this, but I don't hear anyone complaining. Of course not. You're out the door too fast. I think they have an okay time. How do you know? And, 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 and so the odds are, if this is the correction it appears to be, that, that we may have a very strong final year. I mean, how do I know I know? Because they... Yes, because they... How do you know that they're really... What are you saying? That they fake orgasm? It's possible. Get out of here. Now, now remember, on our most important cycle now, the 45-year innovation cycle doubled every 90 years is where we see the biggest bubbles and the biggest resets. Well, they haven't faked it with me. How do you know? This cycle hits around late 2019. That would be the ideal time for this bubble of all bubbles to top. You don't think that I can tell a difference? No. Get out of here. Um, and then we could start to launch into something that could last most of next year. And, and again. Ooh. Are you okay? Oh. Oh, God. Every rally in a bubble tends to get more exponential, more progressive. So, so we could literally see markets go up as much next year as it did in the last few years, uh, in the last uh, peak into January. Ooh, oh, God. Oh. oh. That sort of thing. And we could see the Dow go to 30,000, even as high as 35,000. The NASDAQ could go uh, as, as high as nine to 11,000. So we could get a really strong rally. We call that in our most recent promote promotion out there into the world, the dark window. Oh, oh God. The ideal scenario would be we get one more really strong fifth of fifth of fifth of fifth waves up. Yes, 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 yes. A blow off rally into September or later in 2019, and then we have a 29 to 32 like crash right on that 90 year cycle. And again, bubbles like to go out on a bang, on an orgasm. Yes! Yes! Ah! Oh. Oh. 
I'll have what she's having. <laughs> oh, that was a great video. Yeah. Um, oh. I, I'm just I'm just thankful that I I classed it up with the when Harry met Sally. That's like the important so, part. So I was recommending that we use the uh, the music well, video well, I don't think from Lonely Island it. of uh, <laughs> I Chizzed in My Pants. Okay. I was hoping but, you but, wouldn't you actually know, use you, them. You felt it was inappropriate. Well, yeah. fine. Okay. okay. But it, listen, if they could play it on Saturday Night Live, I mean, come on. We're yeah. on YouTube here, right? Well, what the real question is, what's with Harry and his orgasms? Like, he oh, like, really just... He, he didn't he, just say it once. He, yeah, I know. He, like unbelievable he kept but, hammering uh, at home multiple orgasms so listen <laughs> I, I got i got to take the gloves off here on harry now listen harry dent has written a number of books and uh, i guess because of that we can't say yeah i mean he's a smart guy but he loves to go extreme there's no there's no middle ground for harry uh, he just <laughs> He just he 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 goes full Martin Armstrong, uh, you know. Like when you're making a call, you have to go and do something really extreme. And so, what I, what just I find so funny about this situation is that if you're go like he made a call in 2017. So he wrote the book, The Sale of a Lifetime: How the Great Bubble Burst of 2017 Can Make You Rich. Okay. So he wrote a book saying that there's going to be a monstrous bubble burst in 2017. And you know what? Okay, if I wrote that book, I would turn around and say, well, okay, it didn't happen in 2017, but it's going to happen. So what was right? his forecast? I remember you telling me oh, his yeah, forecast. He, he, he was predicting that the Dow was going to hit 3,800. Oh, so, uh, <laughs> so that's like Elliot Prechter or whatever the guy's yeah, name is. Like, like so, it. but where he got 3,800, why not 4,000 or 3,500? Why 3,800? I have no idea precision, where he's coming up with this Precision, number. That was oh, the no, call. Oh, no, actually, knew. no, no. He did in the video actually talk about wave, fi uh, fifth wave, fifth wave. So he's an Elliot guy. Oh, okay. He, he, he's, he's clearly going to have he's, some Elliot wave uh, uh, persuasion he, he's in He's a him. squiggle guy. This, uh, he's a squiggle guy, clearly. But. What's, what kills me is that if you're going to write a book about the sale of a lifetime and how there's going to be a monstrous bubble burst in 2017, which ended up being a record year for the stock markets, yeah. you don't go into 2018 and turn bullish on the market saying this thing is going to 35000 on the upside on the Dow. <laughs> And then miss the top of the bull market, and the whole, we enter a bear market, and he's bullish. <laughs> like, well, you know what? That's at least our if he opinion stuck to his a guns, market. It's at our... least if he stuck to his guns. Yeah, he he would have claimed be right. that was a year early. Yeah, but instead he totally flip flopped, and now he now he's missed it. Well. <laughs> So I don't think Harry's gonna be phoning us up asking for any. <laughs> like, Look, after your okay. comment, you you obviously have some issues with Harry's predictive abilities. No, I'm just I'm just I feel sorry for the guy. <laughs> I feel sorry for him. You know what? Like, I, I I like to be flexible. I'm willing to kind of make calls, but I don't do crazy call. Okay, I, I did call ninety percent down on Bitcoin and yeah, but like you were this, almost but, right. But I was almost right. But but you know what? I but. I, if if you all I'm just saying, my advice to Harry is that if you're gonna make a bold call like that, just stick to it. Cause you know what, if you're gonna be wrong, be at least spectacularly wrong. But but when you flip flop and you're wrong on both sides, that's the worst. Yeah. No? Well, you know, with his with his orgasmic uh, kind of call <laughs> that he keeps going on about, I'm sure a lot of the bulls will want whatever Harry's having. Yeah, I, I don't <laughs> want any of that. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Okay, Patrick, it's time for Tales from the Trading Desk, but uh, I don't know about you, but I got a kind of a wicked grin on my face from this uh, Bone Crusher beer that's a yeah, wonderful the, the sponsor. Yeah, 7%. It kicks in much much quicker, doesn't yes, it? Yes, it does. It doesn't help yeah, when well, you're doing you're an empty You're not drunk, stone. but you, you, you get giggly faster. Yeah, it's a little bit looser, and, and, and your <laughs> kind of uh, poor Harry Dent is getting the... The, the blunt kind of, end of that the one. The blunt end of that <laughs> one from the, the the beer is talking. Harry, he, Patrick loves you. Don't worry about it. Okay, so <laughs> on to the trails from the trading desk. I think we're going to keep it on to silver, and we're going to talk about leverage ETFs, and you had a bad experience using kind of a okay. double-leveraged 
ETF to bet on silver. Why don't you tell us about it? I, I tend to, when I publish uh, things for my members, I tend to try to stay friendly and, and not publish things as futures trades because not all of my members can tra trade or access the futures market. So I usually want to use some sort of an ETF or something that is accessible by a large audience of people. And, and so um, it was back in 2011. And just like uh, calling the tops on the markets, uh, I saw this parabolic rise on silver. Here, I'll pull up the chart. And in almost a similar fashion to what we saw in the, uh, the Hunt Brothers days in silver, silver was going from 18 bucks up to $50 in, in parabolic fashion. I mean, at the tail end, silver was up two, three, four dollars a day, day after day after day, just ripping higher. We didn't have limit ups on silver the way we did back in the uh, Hunt Brother days, but just a parabolic rise, almost Bitcoin quality in terms of its, <laughs> uh, in terms of that rise. Now, I'm a long term gold and silver bull. I'm not trying to pick on things, but that was a bubble. Yeah. To me. That was a bubble. Like when when something rises like that, it's going to have a mean reverting bubble burst that that brings it back down to earth. Uh, do you agree with that? Like, and that's oh, yeah, that's no. par for the course. And, this it, kind of and chart. in hindsight, it's really easy to call. But uh, you called it at the time, so I, I called it. Like it was it was in the mid forties, around forty five dollars. It still went a few dollars higher when I was calling it. Yeah, well, but you I, know what's funny about that is you you're, you're complaining because you missed it by you know a few dollars. Jim Rogers has a famous story where he says that he shorted gold on the first time up when it went from, I don't know, 300 bucks to 900 bucks, that big, huge move in the late 70s. And he says, I missed the last hundred dollars. I shorted it early, but I was only two days early. But it was yeah. like a huge amount because don't forget that often the, the last 10 percent of the move in terms of time is 50 percent of the price. There's some. Oh, crazy. yeah. Well, it, hey, how is that any different than when we tried to uh, when we just bought the market bottom here over the last week? Right. Like I came in Thursday before the weekend with just a, a few days before we recorded the last episode. And I was already a buyer. But yet the S&P still wiped 100, 150 S&P points lower from when I started buying. Right. Right. And, like it, that, like even if you see that the condition is right. Um, it's just the, the, the drops in the last final days are so huge. They're scary. Like the last, they're scary. The last and, 48. And they make the, no sense oftentimes. Like you could be sitting there yeah. saying, you know, this makes no sense, but it doesn't matter. The market's doing what the market's doing and it just kind of gets a mind of its own. It's yeah. crazy. So anyway, let's get back to the topic. So let's go back to silver. So I went and said, what would be a good way for... Uh, myself and members to get into a short sell on silver. And so we went and we bought the ZSL double leveraged silver short uh, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, ETF. <laughs> and it was a total disappointment. Silver yeah. dropped from 45, uh, for, like, so from $50 down to $30. Like we're talking a 30, 40% wipeout in price. And this thing just tracked it like shit. Wow. Uh, it was awful. And no. so to be fair, it did exactly what the prospectus said it would do. It's not that it didn't track it. It's just that the way that the leverage ETFs work. Yeah. And, and, what, so, and what I would like to bring to your attention is go back to that chart. Yeah. And sh sh oh, whoops. This Here one, we this go. One. Do you see that? So it went down from... 50 down to 32 but then what did it do day. it went back to 44 yeah and that chop is the worst thing ever for it anyways i'll i'll, I'll let you finish and you then know, we're yeah, go through the i math. want you to explain so i want to just touch on here the, so the, here's the z uh, zsl chart and uh, uh so we're uh, let me sorry let me just go back to 2011 i, I thought i had it in place here so back in 2011 the uh, and you know this is why a, a lot of my members i always ask me you know why don't you trade the uh the triple exposure golds and stuff and this story is what i always remind them of right and so here is where essentially 
you know, when it was around $45, you were buying it around 40, right? Okay. In the next few days after it dropped as low as 32, but I didn't get filled at 32. I was, you know, in this kind of 37, 38, 39, $40 range. This, is this where isn't we were. Twitter. You didn't buy the bottom. Didn't buy the bottom. <laughs> and, uh, and so it pops to 60 bucks. Yeah. A hundred percent move in short order. I didn't sell on that high and it, the thing dropped back to 40 bucks, wiping Dang. out the entire gain within three weeks after that. And so it caught the top of silver. Silver went nothing but down from there. And yet this thing basically ended up being break even ended up getting out and some of uh, some people I know actually got out at a loss, even though silver kept crashing. Yeah. Okay. And so, so uh, well, the point I'm going to make, and I'm, I want, I want to really get you started on this in a, in a second, but the point I want to make is that our listeners need to understand to double and triple exposure leveraged ETFs have a fundamental flaw in them. No, I no, learned it through not touching the stove. Well, it's not a fundamental flaw. It's the way they were designed, and I disagree with you that which it's is a fun- a, which, okay. But if the, then would you not say the way they were designed was a flaw? Because t- but when there's somebody, no other when way. Somebody- there's no other way to do what they're trying to do to limit the risk. And so I I, okay. I disagree. But what I okay, will but, say, okay, what I will say, agree let's with, just say somebody is that, they, that that is buying a double or triple exposure, they in their mind believe, okay, without reading the uh, grabbing a magnifying glass and reading the fine print on this ETF, they believe when I'm two times or three times leveraged that I'm going to get two or three times the performance of what the move was. But when something like the ZSL is at your break even, even though silver is $10 lower, I would say that most people, no matter how much you can justify it by the perspective, uh, the prospectus, that would tell you that that's a, that's, uh, so, a flaw. So what it does, it gives yeah, so you explain. double the exposure on a daily basis. Right. And I suspect that if you go and look at it and you go look at the percentage moves, that it accomplished just that. That every single day, it gave you double exposure. And unfortunately, it is a terrible vehicle to hold for the long term oh, in a choppy, my in a choppy market. And so what I've done, so let's go to my chart. I made a chart for you to show you. And so what I did was I took um, the TQQQ and the SQQQ which is, uh, I think it's the NASDAQ th- triple long, triple short. Right. And I figured out the price as of January 1st and I bought uh, 500 grand of each. So I bought 500 grand of the long and I bought 500 grand of the short. So if you think about this kind of like how you're thinking about it, this thing should flatline, right? Like, well, do you, you, well, no, no, it has a carry. We know this. But. Okay. But, but, but the, like what you're, what you're complaining about is that what happened was it moved, you know, X percent and it didn't, up, you know, do two times that percent. Right. That's what fundamentally you're upset about. I'm not upset. No, no. But, uh, what but, I, but what that's I what, try, that's what, what I the feel. Complaint what about. I feel. That's the complaint. What, right? Here's what I feel. I just feel that these products, um, attract retail investors that have no idea what they're buying. Okay. I completely and, agree uh, with and you. And w- so my, my, uh, I w- my whole thing is, is that I just have so many people approach me because I deal with a lot of retail investors and as so many people approach me, Oh, I'm trading these. And it's like, I have to have this conversation so many times like, no, you can't touch these things because yeah. of this. So and, I, I think that what you should be telling them is if you're a day trader, they are perfectly suitable to use as leverage. If you're going to hold them overnight, they're terrible. And and let's go through this chart. So this is, I buy 500 grand of both. If you kind of a year later, if one's moved kind of 10%, then I should be up 20% on that one. And I should be down 20% on the other. Agreed? Right. But unfortunately, that's not how it works. And what, if you look at it, this is the value of that million dollar portfolio over the last year. 
And you'll see that what's happened is over since kind of September, it's gone straight down. Right. I mean, but this is this is what and I uh, we were talking about this because this is the trade that I even put on, not with the cues. What I actually did with that silver trade was I actually went short the double exposure um uh, short and short the double exposure long to create the reverse. Okay, so one second. Let's just let's just let me just go through it with you. Yeah. Let's imagine you are buying um uh like the double inverse, okay, mm -hmm. of, of the triple Qs. And right. you buy a million dollars worth, okay? Right. And so you buy a million dollars worth. What does the um what does the ETF hold on the other side of your trade? They, in this, in, in the, um, often futures. Yeah, okay. So let's just assume they do futures, okay? So you buy a million dollars worth of the double inverse down ETF, okay? Yeah. So they buy, they short $2 million of the futures, okay? Right. Then it goes down 1%, okay? So now you have to go... And if you think about it, their position is up and they are now up kind of, let's, let's just imagine that it started at a hundred bucks, the TQQQ, and it's now gone. It's down 1%. So it's now at 102. Okay. What do they need to do? Because you're going to now need double, double exposure, not from a hundred, but from one oh one oh like uh, what did we say? It's down one percent. Yeah, they so, have to. They so have whoa, whoa. To, so so uh, they have to short more futures because don't forget, as it's going down, they still have to go yeah. and 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 basically, and they have to contend with new money coming in and all this other stuff as well. They're, so the no, but it's it's more importantly is that that you need to go and your your. TQQQ is now not going double inverse from the point that you bought it. It's going double inverse from the from yesterday. It's not from when you bought it that that they're going to go and that yeah. they give you double inverse. It's from every single day. So what that means is that they are selling more on the way down and buying more on the way up. And when it chops around, meaning when it goes down and then back up and then down and back up, they get chewed up something fierce. And that yeah. is in, in essence, what is the problem with these, with these products is that if you went and just imagine you bought your silver and it went straight down every single day and there never had an up day, then it would have done exactly what you wanted it to do. The reason you got tagged is because it chopped around and the more it chops around, the worse you got tagged. Yeah. And that's uh, the, that that's the important sense. thing. That and so, so now this doesn't, this is not an inherent problem in the ETFs that are just buying the underlines, right? That's this correct. Is, uh, it's it, only this, in the leverage because it, they yeah. think about it. If they go and, and they imagine they're double inverse. And then they, the thing goes up 10%. They can't keep their original position. Yeah. Because then all of a sudden they're inverse by more, like they're short more than their hundred per, than their 200%. So they right. have to buy it back to basically make it so they're always 200%. And right. that's the problem is that people think that this is something to hold and it will give you the returns over time of double inverse. No, it will never give you the returns over time of double inverse or double, like double reverse on the in, on the, on the downside or double on the upside. What it'll give you is a series of double inverse or double positive on a daily basis. So, and you know, people need the, to what realize it, what that. It, what it comes down to Kev is that if you want leverage, there are better vehicles than this. Oh, like, you know what? Yeah. yeah as I far as I completely agree. It, and I it, never buy these things and I'm always no. short them. Like I think, and, and we were talking about this off air, how, you know, you said that it's, it's something that you should just short. And I said, yeah, but the real reality is that they trade with wicked boros because everybody's figured this out. It's mm -hmm. not like people haven't 
figured out that 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 this these things decay downward. Now, do they even have the inventory for well? For no, that some anymore? of them are tough to borrow. Like, there's no doubt about it. The 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 interesting thing is though, in a trending market, like if we got your kind of Hunt Brothers silver thing where it just gapped every single day was up, that is like like a a like a Nirvana for for a double like double bull kind of ETF because they're not getting chewed up by the downs and they're just getting longer and longer each day. Anyways, right. it's it, the important and, thing for for people to realize is they're not good long-term vehicles to hold in your account they are trading vehicles and that is it and they will do exactly what they're written to, what they're supposed to do yeah. which is give you the double uh exposure for one day and one day only and don't ever forget that all right let's move on okay patrick it's time for top five things to watch next week before we do that let's go over the top five things from last week Number five. So from last week, number five was you, we were talking about Nike. What's uh, your observation yeah. there? So you were saying it was mine, and I was saying it was yours, and I guess it was mine to be fair. Um, Nike had some good earnings. It it hung in there. I think the market ripped higher. Okay, look, it it, it did gap uh, to about the seventy two seventy three area, but it did drop back down to sixty eight during the market bloodbath. It's back to where it was after the earnings. It's a wash. It's it's holding up. Uh, yeah. It's not where the problem in the market is. Can we agree on that? Yeah. Let's just go on to the next one. Number yeah. Four. So gold, gold, and uh, the gold miners so far they're holding up uh, pretty well. I actually thought once the market was going to start bouncing, that there was a chance that gold was going to give something back, and it hasn't yet. Uh, so far, gold is holding up. Now there's a very important twelve ninety squiggle level <laughs> coming up, and uh, and so th to me. If gold in anywhere around this 1280, 1290 level fails, then it's not yet the time when the big thing has, the big move has started. But if we're north of 1290, my optimism goes, uh, accelerates very bullish after that. We'll see how that plays. What did you always say that a proper technician, when, uh, when it goes higher, I get more bullish? That's right. All you guys yeah. say the same things. I'll buy. I, I like it higher. I like it as it goes up, and I hate it as it goes down. That's all you guys do. I am watching <laughs> a gold price in C and H. I see that it's almost trying to break through the highs of eighty nine hundred. So I'm not much of a squiggle guy, but that's my level. I would love to see it breaking out in uh, the rim in me. Yeah. Uh, number three, you were you were talking about those high yields, and boy, is that market still ugly. Yeah, it's shit. Like like uh, there's just no couching this. It's terrible. Like I'm the bank. What will, what is the credit spread on junk now? Well, before we talk about that, like my canary in the coal mine is this loan fund. I think this is a big deal. And uh, these what was the symbol on it again? B, B K L N. I I just don't see like we had just a ripper. You said of, the fund manager was selling. I know, more than, and so maybe he's smarter than me because I was worried that <laughs> that any time a fund manager goes to extra gets extra cash that that would be the bottom. But talk about like your dead cap balance. This is a true dead cap balance because it is barely budged. It's and barely budged. It's it, awful. And if this is the best thing thing can do in this ripping kind of face ripper of a rally, I'm worried about this thing. And I, oh, think you know what? I th I think that uh, people are underestimating how uh, how messy things will get in the corporate bond market. I am the long treasury, and I would love to be long treasury against the short corpse. Uh, yeah. th I think that uh, that's the way to go. Anyway, well, so number two, oil. I mean, oil hit a short term low. Uh, around the 42 handle, give or take, bounced about 45, still very weak. But you know what? When we went from 77 down to 42, I mean, if it keeps dropping at this pace, it'll be at zero next week. <laughs> uh, and as I, I think that we are overdue for a stabilization period. I'm not in any way bullish oil, but a, a bounce off these levels down here, I it, I honestly think it has to happen. Just because it, if it has, it can only go so low in one wave. Well, like uh, yeah. I, I think I listen. It definitely deeper in the 
bear market can go a lower price. I just don't think it's happening now. Okay, so here's a trade for you. I think you buy oil, sell the stock market. I think that that's going to outperform. I think oil will outperform the stock market from here. It is to the point where it's going to... You're gonna I'm going to track that. I'm going to because I'm going to call you out on that. Sure. Because, uh, because I actually think that the stock market. But no, no. You know, I think that you're going to be par for the course on the two of them. I don't think you're going to have a big move uh, well, uh, off of the thing. I think the two will track very similar. So, and I think that the oil in, uh, sub index will outperform a lot of other indexes. It won't be the top yeah. performing one because that's going to be home builders. Um, but <laughs> you're going to find that the uh, oil, the oil stocks, they're down and out. They're priced for the end of the world. And I think that yeah. they're, there's too much pessimism. pessimism All right. There. So number one, I have to ask you, did you hear anyone else use the term Christmas Eve massacre yet? Because that's what I'm coining that. Yes, what I, I hate to tell my... you this. There was definitely some people talking about that. There was, yeah. right? It was the Christmas Eve massacre. Well, and uh, it was, uh, but the massacre put in the low on the short term. Now, yeah, it's so, by no uh, means a, a, a major low. Actually, let's take is... a moment out here to talk about this Christmas Eve massacre because I see a lot of people blaming Munchkin and and his uh, weird kind Munchkin. of. Uh, <laughs> uh, he made some sort of press release, and I, I think he was in. Mexico with his wife like uh, having a vacation yeah. and he and he had he convened the president's uh, special kind of committee and basically everyone's blaming him for the fact that he kind of induced panic I look at the chart and to me it was actually trading better and it was really President Trump's tweet where he <laughs> he claimed that the Fed can't putt or has no touch on the green or I don't know whatever he said I think every single time he says something to the Fed, the market sells off. And I'm not judging. Don't like don't think I'm making a judgment about Trump. I'm just telling you that the market is highly attuned to ongoing rife between the President Trump and the Fed. And every time he kind of takes a dig at them, he's making it worse for the, the stock market. I just think that everyone wants something to blame. There has to be a reason for everything. I think the market bloodbath was set a, set up all along. Yeah. Uh, anyway, well, uh, anyways, I, I'm going well, to what... agree to disagree because I really thought it was that one tweet that caused the selling and caused the real the the Christmas Eve massacre. The Christmas Eve massacre. Okay, so let's now, listen, move on to the but, top with five said, things. It is a short term week. bottom, but will oh, it sorry. retest? Will will it retest, Kev? Uh, well, I think it's headed lower, so of course it's going to retest. But no, so you, so you're making the call that that's only a, like a swing low, and that we're about to like in the second week of January be at lower lows. I don't know if in the second week of January, but I will definitely say the second well, month. Well, when? Like the okay, second I, I, month. Not, I, you you think like it's going to take four months before it rolls over again? No, I just said four months was the last time. I just think that we're we're due for a four to six week pause, a minimum. Yeah, uh, and and but the, then the market will resume. Uh, lower. So that's listen, my call. My one caveat is if I am wrong about Powell, if Powell comes out and gives Wall Street what they're looking for, then all bets are off and this thing screams higher. But okay. if I'm correct that Powell is going to continue to be kind of uh, sticking his, uh, you know, his uh, fingers in his ears and say, no, 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 I can't hear you to Wall Street. Then I suspect the selling will will start up much quicker than anyone expects. That's my call. Let's move on. Okay, so now on to the top five things of next week. Whoa, uh, actually no, the top three things of next week. <laughs> and I see that yeah. we're still using an old graphic. Well, we're do okay. Listen, it it is the top five things. We debated whether to go top three, but we're definitely doing th top three this week because it's the holiday season and we didn't want to do too much thinking. Yeah, we and couldn't so we actually come up with five things to watch <laughs> next week if we want to be truly honest. And even these three are kind of sketch, so let's just go on. Okay, number so, three is so yours. Number three. And whoa, 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 I watching... think number three you only chose so you could give me some digs. Oh, about yeah, my terrible because call. the Canadian dollar has been just shit. And you you keep trying to jump onto this Canadian dollar uh, bull uh, bandwagon. It, it has to do with my oil call, which is also bad. Well, you just think that everyone's so bearish in Canada. But listen, uh, look, the Canadian dollar has been bleeding since you opened your mouth. <laughs> and... <laughs> 
and this has been nothing but straight down. Yeah. Okay. okay. Again, uh, listen. Against so, the Aussie. Yeah, that's right. So your so trade the, was the CAD Aussie. Yeah. And and it's been kind of a slight flat. win, but to flat. Yeah. Okay. Fair it's enough. It's flat. Yeah. Okay. So so you okay. Your trade is flat, but your call that the Canadian dollar was going to be in much better shape has been a <laughs> shit call. Okay. And I've been short, okay. but I will uh, I will my, own it. There is no doubt about you it. I'm just it, gonna own but, it. But 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 with that said. My, uh, we have a squiggle measurement that 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 comes down to the seventy three level, and it's possible that the Canadian dollar hits a short term low here. So I'm watching this week whether the seventy three handle holds okay. the the Canadian dollar down here. So so what's your number whoa, whoa, two? No, let's. I, okay. I'm not letting you off this seventy three right. handle. Okay. True FX traders do not trade the seventy three handle. Like, let's go. They, can you just put it into the real the real way? Can you can, uh, you, can you reverse it? Spot seven three zero zero. So no one point three six three eight or whatever. Like that's. Oh, you want me to flip it? Yeah, that's how real forex traders do it. Oh, I'm not a. I'm not going to do the forex. <laughs> I I look at the I look at the base currency against the U.S. dollar. I'm not flipping it. Okay. Forget it. I I I, I admire. Well, okay, what what level? Do, what I admire level are you? your integrity. Are we basically there? Is that what you're saying? Is that one thirty six forty? Is is that? Are we there? Okay, hold on. Let me flip this here. Hold on. Let's pull up the chart here. Listen, I understand that the CAD traders trade the USD CAD, yeah. and that's the yeah one thirty seven handle. Okay, so you're looking for just a little bit more CAD weakness. No, that. like that's this third. Yeah, the seventy three cent level, which is about one thirty seven on the. Uh, on the USD right. CAD. So you know what? As a fundamental guy that loves the Canadian dollar, it'll piss me off if your squiggles end up being way better than my call, but so be it. <laughs> I'll be happy to see it stop going down. Okay, let's go on Look, to number two. Uh, yeah, number two. What? So, Kev, what did you want to talk about number two? Okay, so we're kind of, what, one day away, as you reminded me, away from uh, the end of 2018, and I thought I would pull up this chart of all the different asset classes for 2018. And uh, if I said to you, Patrick, what would be the top performing asset class for 2018? What would you pick? Uh well, I already know the answer. Oh, I know. So I don't, so you're supposed to no, pretend, actually, buddy. though, though, I would have actually picked treasuries over. I cash. know you I would have because you're a huge treasury bull all the time. You think that they're always going up, but yes, I, I love treasury bonds. I know. You know what? I, I can't stand how many people are bearish U.S. treasury. Yeah. So <laughs> we're looking at this chart for those that are listening, and it's basically every single asset so, class. First what? of all, everyone should just be looking on the very, very right. Yeah, which is because 2018. This is, this is a matrix just, of going the last 18 So I'm going to start so, from the bottom. So emerging markets down 14%, EFA down 12.5%, commodities down 11%, S&P down 6%, gold down 4%. Global investment grade down three and a half. Global high yield down two and a half. REITs down 1.1. U.S. Treasuries up. So I have to give you credit. You picked the second best performing asset at 0.3%. So it's basically a push. And the number one asset class for 2018 so far is cash at 1.8%. Cash is king, yeah. man. And do you know how long it's been since this has happened? 19 years. 19 how much? years. You have to go to two thousand. So nineteen ninety nine. I guess so. That's what someone said. I don't know. Well, I can't well, do that because you you're here on this chart. Go to two thousand. Yeah, it's been nineteen and years. I, I don't think cash has ever been number one. Yeah, it's not there at the top of the list. Isn't that amazing? You, and you know what? The most amazing thing is David Rosenberg's all over this. He's talking about that uh, that uh, Economist cover where he says the bull market and everything. Remember late two thousand and seventeen. Yeah. They, they came out with this bull market and everything with the big bull yeah. on it. And they talked about how everything's going up. Well, 2008 and 18 has been the bear market and everything. And it's nothing has worked. Even U.S. Nothing Treasuries, which traditionally in a down or risk off environment have prefer, uh, you know, produced positive returns, have basically been unched. So it's yeah. just amazing. And it just goes to show you how, you know, those magazine covers, but, it doesn't do work to the day out that if you use some market timing skills, such as <clears throat> some people squiggles? might know, uh, if you use some squiggles, then it's been a pretty good run on some treasury trades, right? Like yeah. uh, the um, like if you bought the 10 year uh, treasury bond down at the low, <clears throat> some some people may yeah. have done that. But, but, and, but no, I mean, you, you in the just in the last two months have made. Three and a half percent. Yeah, but, That's but not buying bad. the buying the low because you bought every single tick down doesn't count, bud. <laughs> 
Okay, let's move on to number one. What's the number one? Actually, number one's me, isn't it? Number yeah, one, number one yeah. U.S. economic data. We have just a slew of it. You know, we're going to come back from nobody really caring about economic data to all of a sudden we're going to get ISM on Friday, huge number, sorry, on Thursday, huge number. And then the real big number on Friday, which is like employment with the payrolls, they're expecting unemployment to be unchanged at 3.7. That's not really the number that everyone watches. It's the change in payrolls. They're expecting it 185,000 jobs created up from 161,000. This is going to be the most important numbers to watch because the Fed has told you that they're not they're worried about. about the financial conditions. They are worried about the conditions on Main Street. And here is what I contend. This is this is going to be kind of. All right, I'll tell you what I think in a second. Okay, go ahead. this is going to blow your mind. I think bad. Sorry, good economic news is bad for the market because that implies. Uh, so, so you, so you think that we start selling next week? Well, I think so. You think the economy is going to do better? If the economy is doing better than people expect, did you see retail sales? Yeah. Well, if Just that to, if that is the case, I think good economic numbers cause the market stock market and and financial conditions to sell off because that means the fed is going to be hawkish for longer and i know that's kind okay. of very well, counterintuitive that. but that's my that's my gut and and you, my call the numbers still come in strong i think that uh, there's a lag for for how long it's going to take because the fact that the stock market just really got hammered in December, none of these numbers, none of these numbers are going to be reflecting anything negative yet. I think that the real economic data points that are going to be weak maybe starts in March, April. Like I think that we're going to you got I think you have to get into that. Uh, end of the first quarter going into the se uh, second quarter earnings season in order for us to see negative economic data so if i think the uh, numbers are going to come strong and therefore i think that you uh, if your call that the uh, market doesn't like it but hey that's where the double bottom retest imagine that imagine next week th these uh, this data comes out strong what could cause the s&p to wipe out 200 s&p points for a double bottom retest hey there's your catalyst. That's just my theory, though. Like it, and a lot I, of listen, people feel this the is other all way. theories. Yeah. Hey, but listen, our listeners have something to watch next week, don't they? You're absolutely correct. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's move on. So, Kev, parting words of wisdom. You found this one. I love it, but go for it. Well, at the risk of being labeled gold bugs and talking, which about, you are. Well, I wouldn't call myself a gold bug, and and we're traders. Well, we're listen. We're, when gold's going up, we're gonna own the stuff. Yeah. You're right. And um, do you oh, listen? Tell me right now. Do you have a vault with a shitload of gold yeah, in it? Vault. Yeah, I, I, I do. It's double. <laughs> or, right. okay, safety deposit yeah. box. Okay, uh, or how about. No, no, you can't put it in the safety deposit home. box because when the government comes and takes it away from you, you got to have it buried in your backyard, don't you know? Fair with enough. my guns and okay, ammo as well. Do you, Anyways, do you own physical gold? Uh, Answer yes or no. Yes. Okay. So okay. Um, now you're a gold bug. So I'll leave it. I, as, I, I do have some. I do, okay. I'm, no, anyway, go on. Okay. What's the quote? I'm going to leave it with a famous um, uh, quote from J.P. Morgan, who was quite a looker, by the way. Like, look at that handsome yeah. fellow. Yeah. <laughs> He's <laughs> a handsome fellow. Good thing he was rich. Um, <laughs> the uh, gold <laughs> is money. Everything else is credit. J.P. Morgan said that. So now that is 1912, though. Yeah, I guess you're right. So the, the, he didn't get the memo that gold is a barbaric relic. That's right, and I, I wonder what he would think of Bitcoin. Okay, so a final <laughs> thank you and a big shout out to Bone Shaker Unfiltered Indian Pale Ale, just outstanding beer, perfect for the uh, <laughs> the kind of crazy <laughs> markets that we're experiencing lately. I, I think that it was a great pick. Thank you, Bone Shaker. Just quickly, uh, two things. Number one. If you're watching this uh, on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to the channel and give us a couple likes to let us everyone know that this is a great show. And please also share the show with as many people as you can. We It is for free. We, we just do this for uh, me and Kev to just be able to bounce ideas yeah. off of each other and Let, have a lot of fun. Let's just face it. We're just in it for the free beer. We're in it for the free beer. I think that's it's, it. That's what, that's what yeah. it is. But listen, share it with as many people that uh, you think would find this show interesting. Follow us on Twitter. You could follow us at, at the Market Huddle. Uh, you could follow uh, Kevin at Kevin Muir 
um, you can follow me at Patrick Serezna on Twitter as well. Uh, you can um, uh, follow us on the YouTube. What else is there? Oh, uh, Spotify, everything. Just give us give us some kudos anywhere you can. You know, that's assuming that you like it. If you don't like it, just yeah. just do yeah, not like don't don't do, don't give us negative reviews. Just turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thanks again, and I we do appreciate it. We know you have a lot of things that you, a lot of different choices that you can listen to. We do appreciate it, and uh, yeah. all the best to you in the new year. And uh, here's to yeah, hoping happy 2000, new year, everybody. Uh, here's to hoping 2019 is a great one. All right, thanks everyone. Have a great day. Yeah.